Good morning, church. The psalm of the day, our call to worship is Psalm 86. Here's how it goes. Be merciful to me, O Lord, for I am calling on you constantly. Give me happiness, O Lord, for I give myself to you. O Lord, you are so good, so ready to forgive, so full of unfailing love for all who ask for your help. No other God is like you, O Lord. None can do what you do. All the nations you made will come and bow before you, Lord. They will praise your holy name, for you are great, and you perform wonderful deeds. You alone are God. In my wrestling and in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. In the silence, you won't let go. In the questions your truth will hold, your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness, I will follow you. Oh, my lighthouse. My lighthouse, I will trust the promise. You will carry me safe to shore. Safe to shore. Safe to shore. Safe to shore. I won't fear what tomorrow brings with each morning and sing my God's love will lead us through you are the peace in my trouble see oh you are the peace in my trouble see my lighthouse my lighthouse shining in the darkness I will follow you oh my lighthouse my lighthouse Trust the promise, you will carry me safe to show or safe to show or safe to show or safe to shore fire before us, you're the brightest, you will lead us through the storm. Fire before us, you're the brightest, you will lead us through the storm. Hey! Fire before us, you're the brightest, you will lead us through the storm. Fire before us, you're the brightest, you will lead us through the storm. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining darkness I will follow you oh my lighthouse my lighthouse I will trust the promise you will carry me safe to show oh safe to show oh safe to show I was blind, now I'm seeing in color. I was dead, now I'm living forever. 
I have failed, but you were my redeemer. I've been blessed beyond all measure. I was lost, now I'm found by the Father. I've been changed from a ruin to a treasure. I've been given a hope and a future. Two, three, four, five, six. Verse one, two, three, four, five, six. You hold the reins on the sun and the moon like horses driven by kings. Cover the mountains, the valleys below with the breath. Of your mighty wings three, four, five, A treasure of wisdom And things to be known Hidden inside of your hand In this fortunate turn of events You ask me to be your friend You ask me to be Are swimming inside 
the breath of your desire Where could I run and where could I hide From your heart's jelly is fire Treasure of wisdom and things to be known Hidden inside of your hand In this fortunate We praise you right now together as we are all online. Um, we take a moment out of our busy lives. We take away from the distractions. And, and we want to say thank you for being everything to us. Beginning and the end. The Alpha, the Omega. I, I love the line in the song we just sang. All treasure of wisdom and things to be known are hidden inside of your hands. Um, Kids Crossing, if you missed it, they, they talked about a big concept this week, and that is the mystery of God. And one of the tasks they had was to write down uh, some of the things they didn't fully understand of God. And that's one of the beautiful things of the God that we worship, is that he is infinite, and so he is mysterious, and we can never fully understand him. But what we know is that all treasure and wisdom and things to be known are hidden inside of his hand. What a great line. Let's sing that chorus one more time. And you, you are my first, you are my last, you are my future in my past. And you, you are my first, you are my last, you are my future in my past. Amen. 
Well, good morning. My name is Zach, um, and this would normally be the time where I tell you to greet each other, which you are welcome to do in the comments if you'd like. So I'll give you like three seconds. Everybody say hi. Hello. Hello. Um, I'd like to point you to uh, some announcements we have this week. This week we've been treated, truly treated, by the Lund family. I'm going to let them explain what's going on at the crossing. Take two million four hundred and ninety-eight thousand four hundred and ninety-one. And let's not start with Bohemian Rhapsody, okay? Just for the record. That wasn't Bohemian Rhapsody. All right, here we go. Hello, church family. Good morning, everybody. We we are so glad that you chose to come and worship with us this morning. If you wouldn't mind, would you take just a moment, please, and fill out our digital connection card? Not only is it going to let us know that you were here today, but we have this amazing prayer team here at The Crossing, and they want to know specifically how they can be praying for you. So on that card, you're going to find a spot for prayer concerns. You can also lift praises. We love to celebrate answered prayer as much as we love to lift up your concerns right alongside you this week. So let us know that you were here and how we can be praying for you. Well, our family tends to like to do things a little bit creatively. And so here are the rest of your morning announcements. Boom, 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 boom. I know we're all here to live, worship, and praise, but what if you feel called to give in other ways? We've made a real step, it won't take more than a week to give your time today to follow this loop. Speaking of links, isn't there a way for us to stay connected? Why, yes, there is. You can check out Crossing Central on our website. It's the hub for all of our digital programming. And isn't there something going on on Tuesday? Why, yes, there is. Scott Perkins is hosting a Bible study at 8 p.m. right here, live on our Facebook page. Well, that does it for our morning announcements. Thank you for joining us this morning. They didn't know I was in my PJs. <laughs> Well, how about that? I think we're going to have a hard time finding people to do announcements from now on because the Lund family just set the bar like way up there. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Lunds, for your creative way to bring us what's going on. Good morning, everybody. My name is Kendall, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at The Crossing. And we are so glad that you came, whether you're a Crossing regular or it's your first time. Uh, we're just glad that you're here, and we were praying a little bit ago for you and for ourselves, that together as we sing, as we read scripture, that we will meet with God. Because here's the thing, He wants to meet with us. And so wherever you are, in your pajamas, on the couch, in bed, or whatever, I want you to right now just stop and be. Just stop and be fully present to God, ready and listening and waiting for whatever he has for you, for he's got something for you today. So get ready to encounter God. There's just a couple of things I wanted to make you aware of. First of all, in case you didn't hear last week, um, two weeks ago we did our Easter offering, half of which we gave to Faith Neighborhood Center, the other half which we put in our Benevolent Fund or our Crossing Cares Fund to take care of the needs of people in our church and our community. We invite you to be generous and you knocked it out of the park. We raised over $13,000 in one Sunday. So. <laughs> That's just, that's just awesome. It's, it's so cool. So thank you, thank you for being part of that. Um, there's two other things I wanted to bring you up to speed on, and, and I wish I had more speed uh, with, to bring you up to speed with, but the first one is building. Um, I got nothing new for you on our building project. It, the, the permits are still going through the process. Uh, we are heading toward closing on our loan and our contractors are getting ready. So there's a lot of things getting ready to go, but we haven't pulled the trigger. We don't have any permits yet. And so we're just kind of in a, in a, a waiting mode for that. The other thing that probably some of you are wondering is what is our plan for re-entry into the normal world again? You know, what, what's going to happen here? How long are we going to be online? And what's that going to look like? T two comments about that. First of all, um, we're not going back to 
the old normal there, that doesn't exist anymore. We're living in a new normal now, and so we're going to have to kind of figure out what that looks like. Um, one of the main things that we don't know is at what point Eastridge High School is going to be open for business again. And so that's a main driver. So just finally, you know, we're thinking about it, we're praying about it, we're drafting up some plan A, plan B, plan, plan C kinds of things, and we'll let you know what those plans are as soon as we can get a little more definitive on them. This is typically where I would talk about receiving the offering at the end of the service. Uh, we can't do that these days, and we are so grateful that so many of you have started giving online, and if you're not one of them, this would be a good time to begin. You can just follow the link on your screen right there, and it'll help you get started. You know, over and over in Scripture, we are invited, we are urged to be generous according to what God brings us and to use the resources that He brings us to meet the needs of others and to carry out His mission for us. And as we do that, He promises to bless us. One of my favorite scriptures is Proverbs 11:25. This is what it says. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. And that is so true, isn't it? I mean, if you've ever blessed someone else in some way, it, it, it does more for you than it, than it does for them. A generous giver, person will prosper, whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. There's something about using what God has given us to share in His work that brings life to our souls. And so God uses us to make, make a difference. So anyway, thank you for your generosity. Thank you for continuing to be part of what God is doing here and through us at the crossing. It is our habit that whenever we pray for our offering, you always pray for another church in the area because how many churches are there in Central Florida? One. There's one. one, that's right, there's only one. It's the Church of Jesus and we wanna see his church flourish wherever it is. The church of the day is Montbird United Methodist Church. The pastor's name there is, is Nicole Logan. And so we're gonna pray for her and pray for that church and pray for our offering. So would you join me? Father, good morning. We thank you for this day. We thank you that you are for us on this day and you are with us. And through Christ and his presence, you are in us. And Lord, I ask you to open our eyes and our ears to what you have for us today. Would you let our hearts and minds be listening and attuned to your voice. Lord, show us what it looks like to take a step closer to you and then give us the courage to take that step. Father, we want to pray for Mount Bird United Methodist Church and Pastor Nicole Logan there. We ask that that church will be blessed. Lord, we pray that you will sh they will shine the light of Jesus, that they will help people come to know you, Jesus, in, in real, rich, deep ways, and you'll give, it, give them everything that they need to accomplish that task. And Lord, as we give you our gifts today or online or throughout the week in whatever ways that we can, uh, Lord, we ask that you use those gifts to make a difference. And we give them not because we have to, but because we want to be part of what you're doing. And we want to refresh others and in the process be refreshed ourselves. So we give them with joy and we pray that you'll take them and use them for your kingdom. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, a number of years ago, a newspaper from South Africa, the Cape Times, ran an article with this headline, homeowner threatened by the robber he saved. And here's, here's how part of the article reads, a local homeowner surprised nine men robbing his home. Eight of them escaped, but the homeowner managed to shove one into his backyard pool. When he realized the robber couldn't swim, the homeowner jumped in to save him. The Cape Times reports that once he was out of the pool, the wet thief pulled a knife and threatened the man who had just rescued him. The homeowner said, we were still standing near the pool, and so when I saw the knife, I just threw him back in. <laughs> I thought he had a cheek trying to stab me after I had just rescued him. <laughs> uh, the homeowner did jump in and save him a second time. <laughs> So we're in this series called God For Us, God With Us, and it's about a rescue. <laughs> and sometimes, sometimes the, the nation of Israel plays the part of the thief who pulls the knife on God. It's about the story of how God rescued the nation of Israel from slavery in Egypt and how he brought them to freedom. And it's a story of how he still does that today with you and with me. 
Now, last week we saw that our hero Moses, he had this first epic confrontation with Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and it was a complete and miserable failure. Pharaoh laughed him out of the throne room, and he doubled the Israelite slave workload. Everybody was mad at Moses, and Moses was mad at God. And he told him so. And we finished with Exodus 6, verse 1, God's response to Moses, which was this. Then the Lord told Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. When he feels the force of my strong hand, he will let the people go. In fact, he will force them to leave this land. In other words, he said, Moses, this ain't your fight to win. It's not your fight. So stop trying so hard. This is my fight to win. And with that, he sends Moses out on his way again. We're going to jump down to verse 6. Exodus 6, starting with verse 6. God says, Therefore say to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. I will free you from your oppression and will rescue you from your slavery in Egypt. I will redeem you with a powerful arm and great acts of judgment. I will claim you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who has freed you from your oppression in Egypt. I will bring you into the land I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you as your very own possession. I am the Lord. Now, if you were reading along with us just now, did you notice that there was a phrase that got repeated a number of times? It was the phrase, I will. God said, I will free you. I will rescue you. I will redeem you. I will claim you. I will be your God. I will bring you into the land. I will give it to you. It's God the whole way through. By the way, just a little aside, every time the word Lord is in capitals on the screen there in Exodus, it means it's using the Hebrew word Yahweh, which is, is the name that God revealed himself, uh, the name that God revealed for himself to Moses. And, and the name Yahweh or the Lord simply means I am. I am the one who is. I'm the one who is self-existent and I'm self-sustaining and I'm, I'm the one who is over all and above all and greater than all and I always have been and I always will be. I am the Lord. And it's that one, that powerful, mighty, self-existent, self-sustaining God who says, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. We serve a God who will. We serve a God who moves. We serve a God who works. We serve a God who loves. We serve a God who pursues us. We serve a God who is active, a God who is very much alive and involved. And so God says, Moses, go back to the people. I know they're mad at us, but remind them that I am the one who is. Remind them that I am the one who does and that I will move. Verse 9. So Moses told the people of Israel what the Lord had said, but they refused to listen anymore. They had become too discouraged by the brutality of their slavery. That last sentence is just so sad. Too discouraged by the brutality of their slavery. You can't hardly blame them. I mean, they were slaves before Moses showed up, and now they're still slaves, only it's worse. It's not just that their workload got doubled. It, it, it's f f that for just, just a, a moment, just a moment when, when Moses showed up, they had this ray of hope, and it's just been crushed. You know, there's an old saying. It goes like this. A man can live three weeks without food, three days without water, and three minutes without air but he cannot live three seconds without hope. Do you know anyone like that? Maybe it's your neighbor. Maybe it's the person who waves to you so cheerfully while you're socially distancing. Maybe it's a family member or maybe it's you. Maybe like we talked about last week, the cracks and the pressure right now is, is widening in your marriage. The cracks are widening 
in your family, or maybe you can kind of feel all this uncertainty closing in on you as we settle in for who knows what, or maybe there's fear growing, or maybe your finances are dwindling, or maybe it's nothing and everything all at the same time. But whether it's you or somebody you know, here's my message. We have hope because of the God who will. (laughs) We have hope because of the God who will, who sent Jesus, his son. Jesus' disciple Peter wrote a letter, and this is what he writes. He said, for you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Scripture tells us that Jesus died to bring us hope and meaning and life. And when he rose from the dead, he proved that he really can do what he said. Now, I was reading this week a commentary on the book of Exodus, which I'm sure you were as well, because that's a pretty popular thing to do. Anyway, uh, author Peter N. of this commentary wrote something that just stuck in my brain, and and, and it's just really powerful. He he, He writes, Never let your present reality dictate what you think God can or cannot do. Never let your present reality dictate what you think God can or cannot do. As followers of the risen Jesus, we must never let our circumstances shape how we see God. Instead, we must let God shape how we see our circumstances. And this is incredibly spiritual truth that we, that we have to learn. It's, it's, it's the essence of what it means to, to place your faith in Christ, that, that regardless of how it looks, I know that God is here. No matter how things are pressing in on me, I know that Christ is working in me and working in my circumstances. George MacDonald was a Scottish pastor and a theologian in the mid-1800s. I saw a picture of him from the 1860s, and I wish I could show you because he had a full-on hipster beard and swept back long hair. He would be so in style today. But even better than that, he was a very powerful writer. And this is what he writes about this idea of letting God shake our, shape our circumstances. And you can hear the Scottish brogue here. What if the rain be falling and the wind blowing? What if we stand alone or more painful still, have some dear one beside us sharing our outness. What if even the window be not shining because the curtains of good inscrutable drawn across it? Let us think to ourselves or say to our friend, God is. Jesus is not dead. Nothing can be going wrong, however it may look so, to hearts unfinished in childness. Wow. What if the wind be blowing and the window not shining? God is. Jesus is not dead, and therefore, regardless of my circumstances, I am well. The Israelites had not learned this yet, and neither, it would seem, has Moses. If we continue reading verse 10, it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Go back to Pharaoh. I know you blew it miserably last time, but I want you to try again. Go back to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and tell him to let the people of Israel leave the country. But Lord, Moses objected, My own people won't listen to me anymore. How can I expect Pharaoh to listen? I'm such a clumsy speaker. Here he goes. I wonder, is this like the 28th time he said, God, I can't do this? But the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them orders for the Israelites and for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. And so Moses 
goes to Pharaoh. But before we get to that part of the story, we interrupt this story with a very important genealogy. Really, right here at this point in the story. Yeah, it's a genealogy, verses 14 through 25, and you'll be relieved to know that I'm not going to read it right now. But, but what it is, is, is a list of, of Moses and Aaron's family trees. So right now I have a question. Why is that in there? <laughs> why, why, why? If, you know, actually you find these kinds of things all over scripture. You find these lists of names, these lists of gene genealogies, these lists of, of who belongs to what families. And, and I'm wondering, why are they there? Well, there's several good reasons, but here's one really good reason. It places our characters in history. Okay, when, when you read a genealogy, you, you can see this, this person was a father, this person was a son, and the grandson, and the great-grandson, and the family goes on and like this. It reminds us that the people we read about in Scripture, they are real people who actually live. They had parents they had husbands, they had wives, they had children, they had families, they had hopes and dreams, and they loved, and they laughed, and they cried. We have this idea that people like Moses, for example, you know, went around with, with, with a halo on his head, and always his hands were kind of folding, you know, in prayer, and that he spoke in reverent, hushed tones, filled with gravity, let my people go. But the truth is, when you read the stories, you, you realize pretty quick that, that most of the people in Scripture are just like us. That is, they're pretty messed up and, and, and broken. And, and there's a whole lot they did not get right. And the one thing that they all have in common with us is that none of them expected to be used by God to do what He did through them. And it just goes to show you that it doesn't matter who you are, or, or who you are not, God can use you, and He wants to use you. So we get through the genealogy, we get down to verses 26 to 30, and, and we jump back into the story. Verse 30 is kind of a repeat, but Moses argued with the Lord, saying, I can't do it, I'm such a clumsy speaker, why should Pharaoh listen to me? Chapter 7, verse 1, Then the Lord said to Moses, Pay close attention to this. Now, if this was a script for a play, there'd be little brackets here by right next to God's lines, and it, say, it would say, God gives an exasperated sigh, okay? He goes, oh, Moses, would you just listen for a moment? Let me tell you one more time. You are not in charge of Pharaoh. I am. Your job is to go when I tell you to go. Your job is to speak when I tell you to speak, and I will do the rest. Come on, Mo, work with me here. Back to verse 1 again. Then the Lord said to Moses, pay close attention. Mo, listen up. I will make you seem like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. Tell Aaron everything I command you, and Aaron must command Pharaoh to let the people of Israel leave his country. But I will make Pharaoh's heart stubborn so I can multiply my miraculous signs and wonders in the land. And even then, Pharaoh will refuse to listen to you, so I will bring my fist down on Egypt. And then I will rescue my forces, my people, the Israelites, from the land of Egypt with great acts of judgment. When I raise my powerful hand and bring out the Israelites, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. Now this particular paragraph is just laced with significance. I just want to make two observations. First of all, notice that God tells Moses, I'll make you seem like God to Pharaoh. Now you have to remember that Pharaoh thinks he is a God. <laughs> Pharaoh sees himself as a God. So in other words, what God is telling Moses, Moses is, is Mo, this is a God on God encounter. You're standing in for me, but I'm going to be there right with you. And, and Pharaoh is going to keep fighting and striving and kicking and screaming and resisting and refusing. But Moses, make no mistake, I will win this. I will win this and I will display my glory and my wonder and my power. And then Pharaoh, he's going to let you go. 
hey, this is not a case of may the, may the best God win. You know, there's Pharaoh the God, and then there's the God of the Hebrews, and hoo hoo, we don't know how, how it's gonna happen. It's the real God wins, and he always does. <laughs> he always does. There's no uncertainty here. God is firmly in control. We know how the story ends. Second observation, something in here that I find really curious. Verse 5, God says, When I raise my powerful hand and bring out the Israelites, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. Now, that, that's a little bit of a surprise to me because what I was expecting God to say is, when I raise a powerful hand and I bring out the Israelites, then the Israelites will know that I am the Lord. But that's not what it says. It says the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord, the, the, the one who is Yahweh, the I am. Of course, the Israelites will know, but, but, but part of God's plan here is also to reveal himself to the Egyptians. What God is saying here is, I want the Egyptians to know that I am the one who is. They have so many gods, and one by one, I am going to take those gods out until there's one god left standing, me, and the Egyptians have no choice but to acknowledge who I am. You see, God wants the Egyptians to know him too. Do you think that God took pleasure in bringing all the plagues down in Egypt? We'll start talking about that next week and the weeks after. Do you think that, that God was laughing as Pharaoh shook his fist in defiance? Well, I'm going to take my cue from Jesus, who reveals what God is like because he is God. And Jesus, as he was being nailed to the cross, while they were in the act of driving the nails into his hands and feet, said this in Luke 23, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. That's the kind of God we serve, the one who wants to forgive us, even as we're attacking him. And, and this is another one of these themes that, that we find repeated in the book of Exodus, and we find repeated over and over and over in Scripture, God longs for us to know Him. He longs for us to experience Him. All of us. That's been the plan from day one. And it's the plan at the end of time. If you, if you flip all the way to the end of the book, in, in, in the book of Revelation in the Bible, chapter 7, listen to what it describes. I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. And they were shouting with a great roar, salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. You see what this is describing is God's dream. God dreams for you and me and the whole world to be seated by his throne, to come to know him and give ourselves to him and surrender our lives to Jesus. And toward that end, he pursues us. Toward that end, he invites us. Toward that end, he whispers to us, and sometimes he shouts to us if he has to. He will disrupt us. He will do what it takes to get our attention. He does everything we possibly can to draw us toward himself. The ultimate demonstration of God's raging love for us, of course, is Jesus' death and resurrection. The Apostle Paul, who hated Christians till he became one, wrote this in Romans 5, verse 8. He said, But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. In other words, even as we shook our fists at him in defiance, Jesus died for us. Have you ever thought about how ridiculous that is? Have you ever thought about how insane an idea that is? That, that, that A, God would become human, that, that B, he would allow people to spit on him and that C, he would actually allow them to kill him? I mean, what is that? That is some radical kind of love. That, that is a never-ending, unceasing desire to bring us to himself and bring us toward the life that, that we were created for. And, and then there's, there's only one thing that God will not do in his pursuit of us, and that is force us. Because love isn't love unless it is freely chosen. 
Now, I don't know where you are on your spiritual journey, but if you were in a place where you're resisting God right now, stop resisting. <laughs> stop resisting and choose him for the first time or, or choose him again. And, and through Jesus, God offers you and me hope and healing and forgiveness and freedom and purpose and life now and life after this life. And by the way, if you're already a follower of Jesus, this still applies to you. God's Holy Spirit is continually revealing areas in our lives where we are resisting Him. And, and maybe this morning as we've talked even, He's revealed something to you. And if He has, I urge you to soften your heart and repent. That means come back and, and surrender. You know, if I had to pick a theme for this passage today, I would start with Exodus 7, verse 1, where it just reads, Then the Lord said to Moses, Pay close attention to this, I will. Listen, I will, I will, I will. Moses, stop trying to control the narrative and surrender to me because I will. Israel, surrender your fear and your discouragement and cling to me because I will. Pharaoh, surrender your pride and your arrogance and yield to me because I have and I can and I will. And Egypt, know me and surrender yourselves to me, the God who is and the God who will. <laughs> and you, where is God telling you to stop and pay close attention, to stop and surrender because I will? Where are you resisting the God who can and who will? And what would it look like for you to trust him today and fully surrender yourself to him? Ask Zach if he would lead us in the old hymn, I Surrender All. So I want to take a moment just to reflect um, and pray. And so as we sing this, or maybe you don't want to sing it, maybe you just want to listen, but, but let's reflect on the God who will, the God who calls us and invites us to surrender to him to give ourselves to him and let's pray this song together.
You know, over and over, the story in Scripture is that God is for us, and God is with us, and He loves us so radically that He came in the person of Jesus. When we couldn't come to Him, He came to us, he died, and rose from the dead. <laughs> If there's any way that we can help you step closer to that truth, step into it, embrace it, experience it, take the next step on your spiritual journey, we will be honored to do that. Just go to the Crossing Connect, fill out that card, and you can write us a note there. If there's a way that we can pray for you, you can leave it there. We read those, and we will pray for you. But let us help each other to grow and to flourish and to walk toward the God who is the God who will, who is for us and with us. Jesus, I pray that you will let us carry with us this sense this week that you are for us and that you are with us and that you will, that you will move, that you are at work, whether we can see it or not. Give us your joy, your peace, and your rest. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. I was lost with a broken heart You picked me up, now I'm set apart From the ash I am born again Forever safe in the Savior's hands You are more than my words could say I'll follow you, Lord, for all my days Fix my eyes, follow in your ways Forever free in the ending grace you higher your love your love your love ever ending oh, oh, oh. you are Thank you so much for coming to the cross. Well, coming. Thank you for turning on your computer or your phone today and joining us uh, at the Crossing Church. I hope that you have been uh, challenged today and that you will go through this week with different eyes. I want to give a really quick shout out. Thank you, Mark. He's the drums you heard in the background, and we couldn't get a film of him, uh, but he was playing for us along with. So thank you, Mark. We will see you hopefully on Tuesday with Scott Perkins's live Facebook 
uh, uh, Bible study. If not, we'll see you next Sunday.